Hi guys, how are you? Welcome back to my garden. It's been quite a while since I uploaded the last video and the reason for it is quite simple. Summertime is not really the time where I do a lot of fun things in the garden. I basically just maintain and I thought it's not really worth showing you anything. But now going into late summer and especially into autumn, this is the time of the year when I really start doing a lot more projects and a lot more fun things are going to happen here in the garden. But before I just want to share the entire garden with you and really spend some time to do an entire full on garden tour. And as most of the time, I love to start here in the front garden with you. Today, I don't really want to talk too much about each and every single uh, plant and color combination here in the front garden because we want to change something in the front garden big time. There are those areas in the garden where you just observe it and you kind of take it all in how it works over the couple of years and what kind of plant combinations work nice. And I think in general, the front garden is not bad, but there's definitely room for improvement. One of the areas that really is total let lost and horrible here is the lawn. To be fair, I think for you, it might look really nice and green. And you would discover this as a situation throughout the entire garden because July was really rainy here, which is, I mean, it was great for the hydrangeas. It was great for the lawn. It was not so good for sedum, for example. So every single year you have like your beautiful plants and then you have those plants that just don't like the weather situation that much. But even though it looks green, it is a carpet of perennial weeds in here. And whatever we try to tackle, it just kind of didn't work. So there are two options. Option number one is remove everything and just sow fresh lawn. But the problem is we don't really have an irrigation system here. And to my right, there is south and then there is a house here. And the house wall reflects a lot of the heat, which means that if there are two, three weeks without any rain, this is the area of the garden where the lawn looks dreadful first. So what I want to do is remove the lawn, but don't replace it with fresh grass. We just want to do a planting here. And the idea really is to take a lot of the plants that we already grow in this area and have a prairie field. So there is supposed to be like some sort of path going through, winding through the entire planting. And the idea is that now when you're walking here and you will discover it even more in the back of a garden, you are the observer. You stand on the lawn and there is a bed or there is a border and you look at it. But if you do a prairie style garden where you definitely eradicate the lawn entirely and walk through the planting, you discover it totally different. And I think that this is a very interesting thing to do, especially when you play with grasses, for example. You walk along, your fingers are just like going through the grasses, you start touching the perennials, and I think you will experience a garden area totally different. So the idea really is that there will be a nice path here, which goes all the way to the big topiary sphere on the right, and then there the lawn kind of opens up again into the midsection of the garden. And by doing that, there will also be a distinct separation more between the front and the mid and the back section of the garden, which I think is quite interesting. And you see that the front garden, anyways, by the house, by the deck terrace, and by the entire planting here, visually it is already separated from the mid and back section of the garden. Kind of plants that I want to use here definitely in one of color, I want to stay with sulfury yellow, so a lot of euphorbia. I want to stay with my shades of violet and blue, some asters, nepeta, probably also some beautiful um, salvia, sage, caradonna, which is a dark rich purple. And then I was just in the garden center today and I found most beautiful white autumn anemones because I also play with white here. So I didn't buy them today, but I think I'm going to buy them just to make sure that I have them when I plant everything here. So they have a nice tapestry of different heights and colors. I really don't want to have it like this typical buildup of a border lower at the front and then like your mid uh, height and then the tallest at the back. I really want to mix it. You know, if you walk through here and I feel like right next to you, there should be a big miscanthus, that's what it is. It's really just exploring it, kind of like peeking around a corner and discovering a garden totally different. But that's gonna happen another day. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna take you with me now into the midsection of the garden. If we, if you just follow me and we walk along here, you will see by the way, that the wisteria that I trained on a trellis or on a support system looks really beautiful. Now, especially this year, it came with a lot of vigorous growth. I cut it very well, very nice, according to how you should do it. 
It's a very nice green canopy of leaves here. Some of the flowers, they produce seed. If you want to sow those seeds at one point, you can, but it can take between seven to eight years up until they will produce the first bloom. So I think it's always, well, depending on how much time you have, but I think it's always better to go to the garden center and buy wisteria when you see that it is in bloom there. Because this wisteria, I bought it in the garden center when it was not in bloom. And it was a very, very young plant apparently, because this took, I think, five years before I saw the first bloom. But now every single year it is gorgeous. I just came in and quickly gave a little quick trim here to the topiary. It is an arborvitus, I believe, because the front garden, like the hedges and this was here when I came, so I never planted it, but it is kind of in the world of arborvitus. And it's always easy to identify because if you go in there, it's brown in the center and trimming it, you always have to be very, very careful because once I cut it too deep into it, well, it's not going to come back, then it's dead basically. So this is what personally I would always prefer to work with um, you as topiary pieces, but it was here and I love it and I don't want to miss it. So now if we walk here into the midsection of the garden, I think this is very beautiful because suddenly coming from the front garden, the entire garden opens up and you can see what is kind of priceless about the entire property here is that we are on top of a dike. It is a village, basically one road, it's house, house, house in a row. The street is in your back, then there is a river, which means that in your back there's also not a single house. All the houses are literally in a row. And in my back, there is farmland. And since we're on top of a dike, we're elevated, which means the entire landscape opens up really beautifully, especially when the sun is out in the evening hours. Here in the midsection of the garden, I don't want to show you too much of it because there isn't too much going on right now. What is quite pretty is that the dock roses that I actually took from the beach, they flower white and now they start producing these absolute beautiful big and juicy red fruit already a little autumnal feel here white flocks we had a lot of rain just yesterday again and oh there's one of these you're not going to see it we have these insects which are moth i always compare them to uh, hummingbirds i'm not quite sure how they're called actually but since i think three years we have them here too which really excites me if we just walk here, I think this is the area that we want to focus on most. Here you can see already Alfie's with us. And now is actually Alfie's favorite time of the year because not only can we throw branches at her, but the pears, they start to drop from a tree, at least those that are not ripe, and apples too. And Alfie loves to collect them, bring them to me. She wants to throw them, she wants me to throw them, and then she can munch on them. So I'm going to do exactly that, Alfie, right? Here you go. Okay, so she's gonna come with that thing back in a second anyways. But if we take a look here, I love this vista. This is one of my favorite vistas into the garden. And a lot of the plants in particular look fantastic this year. And this really is because we had so much rain in July. Normally when you have the big heat, we had moderate temperatures and a lot of rain. So the hydrangeas, all of these are paniculates, the pointy ones look fantastic. I don't think they ever looked better to how they look now. And you can see if you come a little closer that they start to change the color already a little bit. We're going into autumn. So they start nice and white fresh, then they get chartreuse. And now if you take a real closer look here, they change color into a little bit of a blush tone. Very, very delicate. I really love them. This is an hydrangea that makes fantastic cut flowers, by the way, too, especially if you cut them now, they will stay fresh in the vase forever. And if I wait probably for another two weeks, what happens is that they will dry. So even though that they are dry, they will still look very nice in the vase. So if you cut them in about mid-September time, that is always a perfect time to do so. If we continue walking here, you see Asta Asteron, one of my favorite asters. It's very, very, very vigorous though. It's a beast, but it copes with almost every single situation. It comes to bloom now, a very delicate, beautiful light violet. Here, Cedar Matrona, it grows really well in partly shade. I know According to textbook, Cedar wants to have all the sun in the world, but I kind of discovered that some varieties like Matrona almost thrives best if it is a little bit in partly shade. Still, it wants to have sun, so no double shade, but here, fantastic. Turtle hat, an American plant, a native to the North of America. Really beautiful. I just love this dark, dark green foliage and then these pink flowers here as they open. A little bit like snapdragons. Can you see? You can open them like this. Very cute. And then you have these flower spikes. So as the mature, um, more and more flowers are going to open to the top with these spikes appearing. Really a wonderful plant. More of the same aster. If we continue walking here, I have a nice beautiful drift of box spheres, which I want to train as clouds. 
but this year, as it happened, uh, the caterpillar came for a little visit and you can see it very clearly if you come closer here that the caterpillars, they are eating the leaves away and then some of the leaves, they just start to die back. So really not happy. What I did is I really came in and tried to collect as many caterpillars, or all of them basically, but the plants themselves, they don't look very good. There isn't too much that you can do rather than collect them. And I think for me, this is now my warning shot that I'm not going to purchase any more books for the garden. I hope that they make it. And if they don't, I'm going to replace them by you because you spheres, they are a lot more resistant and uh, caterpillars don't do any damage there. So if we continue walking here, I want to show you these. These are also a uh, hydrangea paniculata. This is strong Annabelle, how it's called in Europe. I think in the US they're called incredible, if I'm not wrong, by proven winners. Uh, I planted them in partly shade because I did a little research and if you put them in full sun, they will flower more and richer. But even if it is a strong Annabelle, what a lot of people say is that it might flop over and especially after a week of rain, it might not hold itself upright. So what I did, so I put it again in partly shade and even after a very, very rainy July, these are still looking fairly good. A lot of uh, snuck, uh, snail, slug and snail damage on the leaves though, but at least the flower stems are still upright. I haven't put any support in there at all, so I haven't staked anything. And I feel like, yeah, it is good. I'm kind of excited to see how they're going to grow in and how they're going to look across the next couple of years. But so far, so good. I'm very, very happy with them. And I'm kind of thinking about, I just bought two last year to see how it goes. There's still quite a big hole here on the left. So I think I might still buy two more eventually just to fill it. But when I buy a total new plant and I had the old Annabelle variety in the past, which really did not work well. I was cautious, so I thought, buy two, see how it goes. But I think it is definitely a success story. What else is here? Very cute. One plant that I love, and sometimes it's a little difficult, autumn anemones. They're a little bit hidden behind the rose note. In theory, they were supposed to be one meter 50 in height. This is a variety called Serenada. Serenada, Serenadi, something like this. Very nice, blush pink all open pollen, so a lot of bees come in. Bumblebees, a little more pink at the back of a flower. But they, honestly, they look good. They really start to get established when I bought them. They were itty bitty tiny plants and they look in general very cute and very, very nice. This here in my back, this is what I always refer to as my new perennial border. I really have to find a nicer way for it at one point because it's not so new anymore, but it's definitely beautiful. It is really with an emphasis on having a beautiful autumnal garden. And now is a time of the year in late summer where you really see how the entire concept comes together. So we have beautiful grasses here. This is a panacetum, which never comes to flower here, but I don't mind it to be honest because I just love the height that it has. I love how it softens the edges. It's very delicate, it's very whimsical when the wind catches it and when the light comes from my back because in my back there is west. Here, there is sedum in the fullest sun and unfortunately, it's the same variety that I grow in partly shade and in partly shade it grows so much better than in full sun. I'm not quite sure what to do with that though, but I just love the heights and the levels here. So what I don't want to have in the front garden, I really want to have here. I want to have a classic nice border with like shorter plants in the front and something nice in the middle like this beautiful persicaria. This is J.S. Kalo. This is my favorite persicaria. Wonderful cherry red, has really nice autumnal foliage and it flowers for ages. And in the back there is Calamagrostis calfurster planted in a nice drift. A lot of people always use Calamagrostis calfurster as a blob, a single one, which I also do in the walnut, in the uh, walnut bed or on the island bed in your back. I'm not going to show it to you now because I want to do a separate video where I'm just going to explain to you what you can use if you have walnut trees and how to underplant them because quite a lot of you always reach out to me and say like, what do you do? We have walnut trees and nothing grows under it. And honestly, when I started it, I had no idea that walnut trees apparently have a bad reputation. So I just planted and at one point I just learned and figured what works, but I'm going to do a separate video about it. If we continue here, yesterday we had a lot of rain. So the phlox, you can still see it in the back. This is my all time favorite variety. It's called Goliath. There is Hercules, which is pink, and then there is Goliath, which is purple. In theory, they're supposed to be like one meter 20, one meter 30 in height. They are my height, so 180. 
which is incredible. They really, really love to grow there and they are just a fantastic flux variety. If you come closer here, in the front, there is again a massive huge drift of Aster Astron, which I'm going to reduce because I think it is too much and I want to have something in the front here. But in the back, there is Helenium. I hope you can see it. It's the orange thing that you see there. And there's a variety called Hot Lava. And every single year where I do the garden tour here, I stand here and I struggle with that. And in the previous two years, Hot Lava was at least kind of a red tone. And this year it was no red at all. It was just orange and it's just not the color scheme for the area here. So I make the decision to lift them. They will go to, I'm not gonna throw them away. They will go to a different area, like a newer area of the garden where I do have tones of orange and I think they would just make sense there. What I wanna do there is I wanna put some more beautiful hydrangeas here. I bought them today in the garden center. They are again a paniculata. They come with a label. I will do a planting video with them though. So this is still gonna happen. I'm still gonna tell you the name. They are called Hydrangea Living Strawberry Blossom. And what is very beautiful about them is that they have an evolution of color. So as they start to open, they, which is normally supposed to happen more in July, but since they come from a garden center in pots like this, they are more whitish and greenish. And then about this time of the year, as they mature, and you will see this here, the flower heads are supposed to look like this, which is kind of like a very delicate, nice blush tone, still like this creamy on the inside. But in general, I think in terms of color, this is gonna work really beautiful here in the border. And what happens too is once you're here, I have to show you, look here. Look in here, the leaves, they start to change colors. So I think that this variety, it doesn't mention on the label, but I think looking at this, that the leaves will have a really beautiful autumnal color too, which I think is quite fun in the border. But Around this time of the year, the flowers should be more in a blush pinkish tone. And I think it is going to work really well because I have some red amaranth in here now. I have the purple from the phlox. I have pink in the back. I have the light violet here from the asters. I have the cherry red from the bestorter. So I think in terms of color, it fits very well here. And also I think it's nice to have these big mop heads of flower because it is in the distance, so they will give you a nice impact when you're sitting on the terrace and you will look straight through the garden and you will see them here. So I think that this will be quite a nice improvement of the entire area. One thing that is still gonna happen this year, finally, I keep on talking about it endlessly, but now really want to do it, is to finally tackle this area here and start an entire new border. So what we did is we already put a watering hose here. And um, with the water hose, you can very easily define how the dimensions of a new border or flower bed, however you want to call it, are supposed to be. So we're really going to swoop out quite big. Everything is organic here. We don't have straight lines here at all. In general, we are going to reduce the amount of lawn quite tremendously, to be honest. But what you can see too is if we walk in here, so far, when you paid attention to the lawn, everything was nice and green. And then here, even though there was a lot of rain in July, the lawn is nice and brown. It's just not good. There is a lot of sun here. And I think what I need to do is remove the turf, come in with a lot and a lot of good organic matter, compost, uh, fresh soil from the garden center and just really improve the entire soil here. What we want to do though is that over here, there will be an entrance to the entire area. So if you come from your side, you can walk along here, and then in the back there is the gate, where we're gonna walk in a second, but then you can also take a right turn here and walk straight through the entire border. So the idea is that here is a potting bench, and I already put more hydrangeas here, because I also, this already tipped over now, uh, I want to change the planting a little bit and I want to put some more beautiful hydrangea paniculata here. This is a variety called Panorama and I think they're very beautiful. They will be a little shorter than the other variety that I just showed you but I think the perfect height for here because they are pretty much in the front of the walk. But then we can just walk along here along the potting bench which is now hidden underneath the protection. There's a plum tree and then here the, the path is supposed to swing a little bit into the entire border because I have this massive wall 
of miscanthus grass here and I think it would be quite boring if you would just kind of like walk here like next to the miscanthus grass. I really want to put something here to soften the edge and just really to make sure that you can explore also this border which I think would be very very interesting and then at the end this is supposed to open up and here we want to have a circle as a terrace probably with gravel as a ground, I'm not quite sure yet. This is up for discussion still, but we kind of said that gravel would be the nicest. Also of the sound when you step on it, it's just nice. I still want to have a fire bowl here. We just discussed it. I might be the only one who wants to have it. So I just buy it secretly and still put it here. Because I think in like September, October time, it's quite nice and cute to sit here on one of these deck chairs. We well. There is just one at the moment because we just bought it ourselves. But then we have like two, three deck chairs here, a nice fire bowl. And then you're sitting in the middle of all the planting. I think this would be just fantastic. What I want to do too is I would love to plant another tree here. I already know what I want to plant, but it's very difficult to get it here in Poland. So I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what to do on this day. <laughs> at one point just rent a car, drive to Germany, buy it there and come back here. It's a liquid amber and the variety is called Silver King. And what is beautiful is it has a leaf variegation, white and green in summer. And then in autumn liquid amber just changes the color to glorious shapes of crimson and really fire engine red. And because that variety has a leaf variegation, you will have two different tones of red in autumn too. And since all of this, like when you look at all the trees here, everything is green, green, green. I just love to have at least some kind of trees that have a little more excitement with the leaves and we already have the dark red leaf over there just behind the garage I hope you can see it actually there which is an Acer so I don't want to have the exact same thing here and over the years it's going to grow this is going to be exciting and I think this liquid amber will be very exciting here because it is going to add something different to the entire area but this is the plan it is frightening big to be honest but on the other hand I think it's going to be a great big fun project. For the front garden I'm going to use a lot of the plants that I propagated myself like um, I hope I think I'm going to share a video about it. I uh, took cuttings from Euphorbia and they've all rooted and they look really good. I have cuttings from Salvia caradonna. They also look very good. So I can show you those. So for the front garden, actually, I propagated quite a lot of the plants. What we're gonna do now is, maybe you can follow me so I can just show you one more thing before we go down because I don't wanna show you the entire like back of a garden while walking over it. I think the nicest thing is if we really go really to the last, last layer of it. But one thing which I think is quite nice, the way on how you enter the back of a garden now, especially this side here. I love this view. Look at the Paris now. This is so, so pretty. All these perennials here and then the branch full and full of pears. Isn't that fantastic? I think we never had so many beautiful looking pears here. I mean, some of them are not looking so beautiful, but in general, it's great. And then when you have the view straight through here onto the bench with the Verbena bonariensis in the purple, sedum, asters. I mean, I really love to have same plants and repeat them. I think it is just very soothing for the eye. And this is why I think I treat the mid and bed uh, back section of the garden as one area. Here, beautiful grass, unfortunately annual. This is Panacetum vertigo. And for me, this is a whopper of a size. I know if you are in a way warmer climate, this can grow to a monster. For me, here in my climate zone, this is a monstrous size already. One thing that we changed and we started already, and I'm not sure if I showed you, so I really want to show you, is then the back here, we are building a little bit of a deck terrace. So right now, <laughs> it looks a little lukewarm because we kind of ran out of material and we still have to finish it. But what I did is I started to build a framework made of wood that I stained black. And then on top of it, I bought these planks here. They are a compound, I think made of wood and plastic, if I'm not wrong. So at least that they will withstand the weather situation here. So close to the Baltic Sea, just to have a nice back terrace here in a way. You can really take a little chair and sit here. It's sun-filled, it's beautiful. Yes, you're sitting next to the compost, which might be a little funny, but in general, I think it is going to be a big, big improvement. What I want to do now is take you really all the way down with me into a brand new area of the garden, which I always refer to as no man's land. Walk you through there so you can see what happened there. And when we're down there, you have a nice view onto the terrace garden, which is in my back. We're here now in the brand new area, which I always refer to as no man's land. And all of you who follow my channel and my videos, you might remember that almost a year ago, I started doing the first video here where I showed you this area and showed you how totally overgrown it is. And just 
look at the transformation that we achieved here, especially in your back where I'm going to walk with you in a moment. So this here is an extension to the fruit and vegetable garden. There are raised beds in here. Unfortunately, um, some things worked really brilliant and some didn't. So my broccoli was kind of... Uh, not very good this year. <laughs> My cauliflower was even worse, but the strawberries are fantastic. I have a raised bed only with a variety which is called San Andreas. And the lovely thing about that variety is that you can harvest throughout the entire growing season, even now. Like they are producing a lot of flowers and uh, uh, fruit right now, very tasty. Funny thing is they taste even better now than they tasted in June. So if you're looking for a really good strawberry that produces a lot of fruit throughout the entire growing season, San Andreas might be a very interesting variety for you. We're gonna see quite some nice dahlias here because I also wanna focus on cut flowers and moving into next year, I wanna focus even more onto the topic of cut flowers. There are some dahlias here. This is a variety called Danik. Problem here is that there are a lot of slugs and snails because like in my back there is a forest of stinging nettles and then there is like a strip of like more no man's land and the farmland. So a lot of slugs and snails are here. That is just what it is. But still, Danique is holding herself upright. She's very pretty, very beautiful color. Then I've got some uh, Rebecca here. Well, honestly, I'm not quite sure what I was thinking when I bought the seeds. And that Rebecca is just like, you might not like me, but we love it here. Normally, I don't really love orange and brown together, these like 70 colors. I bought those seeds, not quite sure why. Probably I'm gonna make a beautiful flower bouquet in autumn with them. They look fantastic though, by the way, which is really, really pretty. Here, this is where I grew quite some of my cut flowers. So there's still a little bit of amaranth here, beautiful pinkish tassels, Fabina bonariensis. And here, <coughs> excuse me, this is a day here where I was really excited about. This was supposed to be a fairway peach. And peach, it is not. It is kind of orange in all its shades. It's like yellow, orange, it's spiky, I don't know. The thing is like when I saw the first bloom appearing, I was like, okay, it is what it is. I don't have the heart just to cut it back and just replace it by something else. I'm like, I'm gonna allow it to let it do its thing and then end of a year, I'm gonna give it to a neighbor and then they can hopefully grow it and the daily is gonna make them happy because it's really, it's just not my color. So next year I'm gonna do something totally different here. Still some belt of island here, some zinnias that made it through all the slug and snail attacks. Very pretty, I love zinnias. I wish that they would love me more. Well, they love me, they just don't love the slugs and snails. So this is the biggest problem. But if we continue walking, um, it is really interesting if you have a look and what happens here. So if you just really see how the entire path kind of meanders through here and how the planting looks at this time of the year. Cosmos, one of my favorites. This is a variety called Apricotta. Very easy to grow from seed. Most of them, I haven't even pinched them out, which normally I always recommend and I always do, but they immediately grew so bushy and they are so lovely and so vigorous that I didn't really have to pinch them out and they reward me with a lot and a lot of blooms. The one thing that you have to do at this time of the year is come in and all those spent flower heads, you really want to nip them off because if you do that, so if you dead had them, then you basically give a signal to the plant saying like, I haven't produced seed, I don't have offspring for next year, which happens on annual plants. So they will produce more and more flowers. If I would have allowed them to go to seed, at this time of the year, maybe they wouldn't even produce a lot of blooms anymore because they're just like, okay, we set seed, we have a lot of seed, so we can just like sprinkle them everywhere and then we can stop and kind of just like gracefully and happily die back after this year. And by doing that, I don't allow them. So if we walk here, very interesting Eucharist that I planted with you. The Eucharist look best in this part of the garden. I think because it is a little bit in a ditch here. So it's very moist, very wet. It's, um, it's a funny situation with sun. It's a lot of sun, but only during the lunchtime. Uh, for two hours, I believe, there is shade here. And I think this really does magic for Eucharist. I mean, look at the foliage. They are blooming endlessly. They're always producing blooms throughout the entire year. I wish I knew what variety it is. It is one of those things where I went to the garden center and it didn't give me a variety name. Such a shame, but they are fantastic. So I really want to encourage everybody, if you're looking for something to frame a border or a path, Eucharist are just fantastic. So are geranium. I got these as a gift from a friend in Germany. Tiny plants when I put them in the ground and look at them, it's a carpet of beauty already. They flowered pink. 
And what they're supposed to do in autumn is at the leaves supposed to change color into crimson. So I'm really excited that one leaf already did a little bit here, but I think it's just because slugs and snails came in. I'm gonna give you updates and gonna keep you posted. What you can see though is that uh, earlier on in the year, well, I think even last year, I did some nice fence sections here made of my hazel cutting, so some wattle fences. And I love them because they just like, they frame it very beautifully. They give an element of like country, what I love here. And I think it's just like nice to have the texture also in here. It's kind of like a little architectural element in a way, which is nice. More hydrangeas. These hydrangeas actually started the entire area. I had them first underneath the walnut trees and they were a total disaster there. Then I planted them onto the terrace garden and they were just halfway through a disaster, but still not nice. And then one and a half years ago, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna put them here. They can do their thing. I don't care about them anymore. And then once they were here, they started to come to life. Look at these flower heads, how massive they are. I wish I could tell you the variety name. I bought them so many years ago that I really have no idea what they are, but I really love it here. It's so fantastic. And I think year after year, they're really gonna be better now, which is so pretty. Continue walking, more beautiful eucharist, a big drift of sedum. This is a variety called Herbstfreude, which translates from German into English as joy of the autumnal season. And I think when they come to bloom, they're really going to give an amazing impact. A lot of grasses here, all of these, they are offspring from the upper garden. Like they were self-seeding somewhere in the middle of the border. And I always have a really, really tough time with weeding perennials. When I see that perennials are spreading somewhere and that they're producing offspring, I'm just like, oh, you look nice. And I know how you're going to look, how you're going to look when you come to bloom. So I'm trying to always find a home for that. So no, Man Land, no Man's Land was a great opportunity for me to give a lot of these plants a new home here. Some tiny little stools. Actually, these were the steps that I used to get up and down the terrace garden, but now I have some really beautiful uh, stairs that I built my own. So I put these little stools here. They already start to fall and crumble apart. I mean, they're for indoors actually. But I thought, you know what, for as long as they are nice, they can stay here and then I have something to sit down, which is really cute. Perovskia that I planted in a big, big drift here. Very pretty. It's already flowering for ages, at least for two months by now. And what I love is the combination of these really delicate Perovskia spheres it's Russian sage, by the way, this is the common name. Has a very nice smell too to it. And then in the back here, more dahlias. They are the best dahlias for this year. This is a variety called Rancho. And this is a kind of orange that I like. It's not bright, bright orange. It is soft. It has something, do you know, uh, Capri eyes the popsicle. This is exactly what it reminds me of. It has a color of summer and this is what I love about it. So I'm very happy with them. Again, I have to come in and deadhead them a little bit. Every spent flower hat should go to make sure that they keep on producing more and more blooms. I also took some for cut flowers because they have really nice stems that you can cut easily. They look fantastic in the vase because sometimes dahlias have the thing that they produce a stem and then the bloom is kind of like facing like outwards like a sunflower and they don't. Can you see, like if I would cut this, the bloom is almost facing upwards. So you can manipulate them and you can really use them very beautiful for flower arrangements. So if you want to have dahlias in this world of color for cut flowers, Rancho is definitely a great, great variety for you. If we continue walking into the last bit, more grasses, more persicaria, that is all offspring from the upper garden here. Um, then this is an area where I, started a grass border. I did a video about it and obviously it has to establish. So again, like the panacea and vertigo looks fantastic already. Um, some asters are here. Then this is one of the miscanthus that I planted. Still, all of them are very small. It just really needs a year or two for most of the grasses to get established really well. So whatever you're gonna see here still is very, very small. What is really nice is that the brown um, digitalis that I, grow from seed earlier on in the year, looks really nice. Slugs and snails came in, but still, I think in general, they look really good. And I think next year, this will be a very fun display of spikes of like little brown flowers. So I can't wait to show you how they're going to look. So then it basically ends here. So it just swoops around here, miscanthus grasses, asters, they were also given to me. So this is offspring from Bars Pink, but it was grown from seed. So since it's grown from seed, they are not totally pink. They are a little bit 
in a purplish world, which is still very, very beautiful. One thing that you should do though, is swing around and take a quick look to the side, because this is where the terrace garden is, and it is really beautiful, big, lush and overgrown almost. The last layer, you can still see the, you see the landscape fabric. This is what I still have to mantle. But then in the middle layers, you see black wood. This is how all the terraces are supposed to look like. Three years ago, this was a steep slope. Couldn't walk over on it. And now it is such a beautiful site. A lot of fun, fun plants. One thing that went on there, it's very small, um, are the... Oh God, I want to say lupins, it's not. It doesn't come to me now. It's like, it doesn't come to me. I sowed from seed. <laughs> I do a different video when I'm going to show you. Um, luckily they came this year. They're very small still. So there are some things that I test out and this is how I treat the terrace garden is that I use a lot of tender plants. I use a lot of annuals and I really love to play with different color combinations, especially over there on the left, you see again, this really beautiful cosmos apricotta in combination with amaranth, which is hot biscuit. And I think that they work really beautiful. And then in the back, some pink zinnias, you can see this is El Dorado, a really beautiful variety for zinnias. They almost look like dahlias. So in general, the terrace garden is an area of the garden that makes me very, very happy. And this is it pretty much for the garden tour. So trying to find a nice backdrop now where you can have a look at, I think this is nice, right? You can really get to see these beautiful dahlias, you see the uh, persicaria, you just get this nice vista into this entire area and really think back how all of this looked a year ago. It was a big tangle. You could hardly walk through here and now it really is like, a last bit extension of the garden. It makes me so happy and I think it looks fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed today's garden tour. More videos are gonna happen. I already gave you quite a lot of sneak peeks about things that are going to happen. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Thank you if you decide to subscribe to my channel. Thank you if you give me a thumbs up. If you wanna see more from my garden account, I already uploaded a couple of videos. So you really can see a lot of the projects that I share with you over the year. And now is the time of the year when I'm going to spend more time in the garden again and also wanna share more videos. So take care guys, have a lovely day and I'm very happy to welcome you very soon again in my garden. Bye.